The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IA exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is proudly brought to you by NetWealth. For over 21 years, NetWealth has provided market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help wealth businesses thrive. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience, and see wealth differently. Visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello, and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and this week, we're going to deep dive into NetWealth's 2022 Advice Tech Report. So, joining me here today is a believer in developing kids' financial literacy, an IPO survivor, the reason we call Highlighter Pens texters, and a ninja-level tech geek. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Matt Heiner. Woo! Thanks, Peter. Great to be here. And that's definitely the best introduction I've ever received. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, you'll have the benchmark now. You can hand that out to people. I love it. Now, I'm keen to sort of dive into the report. It is something that I'm a big fan of. Um, but I just wanted to get to know you and the listeners get to know you a little better through your use of technology. So let's kick off with what your most used emoji is. Do you use emojis? I do. I was actually uh, talking about this the other day because my colleagues were commenting on uh, how I'm an overuser of emojis. Uh, they're, uh, they're they're fantastic. And given that you gave me 30 seconds heads up that this question was coming, <laughs> I did I did cheat and I just t- uh, had a look at my most used emojis on my mobile phone. Um, and I was a bit surprised actually. Uh, there's quite a few of them. Uh, strong arm that that gets a lot of okay, views. Nice. Uh, the the clap. Um, I find that I'm congr- congratulating people quite often. Mm-hmm. Uh, the detective. I can't remember in what context I was using that particular one <laughs> uh, but, I, but I'm big on the thumbs up so that's probably yeah. my most used one fair enough that's a common answer that one um, and what about if you just walk and I mean asking you or I this question is probably tough because we we live with our smartphones on at all times but if you had to delete everything off the smartphone and just keep three apps which three would you keep yeah, good question as well. I think I'm up to about about page eleven on my uh, on my apps. I, I tend to download many um, most weeks. If I had to only leave three, um, and this is going to make me sound like a big geek, um, I would keep the AFR. That is just something that I'm yeah. religious about. It's, it's one of the first that I look at in the morning, even at the moment with the uh, the headlines. Yeah, uh, you know, clearly the Net Wealth app. Uh, couldn't live without that one, uh, and I think probably my emails. Yeah, nice. Yeah, function. Right? Raw function. Function. I like it. All right. So let's dive into the most recent Advice Tech Insights sort of report. Now, for the listener, if you haven't come across the Net Wealth Advice Tech report, then, well, you must have been, A, living under a rock. But still, I would highly suggest that you head over to the link in the show notes um, as it, look, serves as a huge resource. It can be something of a wish list or a place to start list when you're considering new tech for your business. And it also gives you a really good peek at where the most tech-driven practice as a sort of focusing into the future. So it's sort of a must read for me each year. But I thought before we dive in, we might take a bit of a look at what triggered you guys to start doing it. This is the fifth year, right, of the report? Uh, the fifth or the sixth year, yes, sixth that's year. correct. Yeah. So what started you producing the report, given you're not actually a tech uh, – well, I know that you might view you guys as a tech provider, but in terms of doing the advice tech report, what triggered that? 
Yeah, so it obviously goes back quite some time now. And uh, really, if you think back six, seven years ago, um, technology was starting to become you know, pretty prevalent in not only our daily lives, but also clearly in our business lives. Yeah. And as we were looking around the industry and, and talking to, to advisors, um, it became pretty apparent that it was incredibly fragmented. Uh, and when we were starting to develop our own products and, and think about our roadmap and, and what the future might look like, uh, we started to map out, you know, what are the different um, technologies that are being used in the industry, you know, what would the potential integration points be? And as we went down that rabbit hole, uh, we got deeper and deeper, and it's turned into a report that's now uh, become in many ways a bit of an industry staple uh, year on year and, um, you know, been incredibly well received. But it's it's invaluable uh, document and process for us as a business, uh, and um, it's also all about us giving back to the industry so where we can help educate advisors or, or give them a bit of a um, nudge along on their tech tech adoption journey. Um, we're always very happy to help, and, um, you know, each year we, we draw incredible insights from it. And I think even I took a bit of a peek back and and you can even see reflected in the tech uh, the evolution from sort of the big players like the big institutions or deal groups defining what tech and what happens through to now where it is a bit more accessible to the small practices. They can make choices that are just for them. Like, I, And I think you can see that in the report and what people are focusing in on and what they're, you know, implementing. It's not quite the one big institution defining where the money gets spent, you know, in advice tech, which is a bit exciting. Uh, absolutely. If you if you look back five or six years, uh, you know, advice tech really, when advisors thought about it, was their financial planning software and a platform. Uh, <laughs> and then there was just such a proliferation of uh, technology that people started to get quite um, quite considered and um, interested in just all the different parts that could be automated. And it might have been, you know, thinking back to even some of the conferences we've been on when Zapier first hit the market. Yes. Uh, you know, just it opened up people's eyes to the possibilities of, of what they could actually do from not only a business efficiency perspective, uh, but also from a client um, engagement perspective and delivering better services uh, more real time to their end client. Yeah, and what's exciting about that too for me is is look, big institutions struggle to react to needs or demands from either advisors or the consumer. Whereas once you know small practices or just you know advice practices realise what they can do with tech, then they can be more nimble. You know, there's probably one or two people making that decision, not a committee of thirty. So that to me is really exciting too because we can respond to what's going out in the marketplace. And it was quite exciting to see some of the uh, more progressive licensees actually realising that trend very early on. And as we know, everyone's incredibly business. Um, technology yeah. doesn't naturally come to, to many people. Um, so a number of the progressive licensees that we were working with actually took it upon themselves to start looking out into the marketplace and trying to make sense of what the tech stack could look like, uh, but also taking a very flexible approach to realise that it was more than just a, uh, a planning software and platform discussion. It was far, far broader. Yeah. And like you say, it's 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 gone beyond just because of the way we all interact with technology. And, you know, each year you sort of have the, the key themes, you know, the things that stand out from the data you've collected. And I can see that there's, you know, a particular point this year that's really drawing out that human side of technology. It's become more than just, you know, numbers and, and us using it sort of inwardly. It's something that's really about how the public use it. And I'm betting even how advisors use the technology. Is that right? Is that what stood out? Yeah, there's a couple of things that stood out this year, which uh, we'll do a bit of a deep dive on, but it was uh, particularly pleasing because we've been doing this report for a long time, as you mentioned. Um, and for quite a few years there, we saw, you know, really high intentions, people wanting to do things, but no one actually doing anything. Uh, and then really through COVID, when people were stuck in their bedrooms and had a little bit more time to think about these things, but also had a real uh, aha moment when things didn't work, uh, we started to see those intentions converting into action. Uh, and, and for us, that's been really pleasing and satisfying to, to know that uh, people are actually thinking about these things more broadly and then actually doing something about them. Um, but from a, a, a people perspective or a human side, uh, one of the you know the key areas of focus at the moment, uh, which just reflects the the broader macro environment that we're in, is how do we use technology or how do we understand how technology impacts our staff? Uh, so we're all struggling to find staff, we're all struggling to retain staff, um, whether it's the great resignation or the great reshuffle. <laughs> um, we need to be conscious of everything that we're doing within our businesses, and you know, no one wants to come to work and have to deal with crappy tech. Uh, we've got enough things going on without having to work through laboriously, uh, you know, poor UX or UIs. Uh, yeah. And we, we expect these days that, um, you know, in the same way that our lives operate and social media integrates with everything else that we're doing, that the technology we're using at work uh, is equally seamless um, and in many cases also enjoyable. 
It really is the the team's use of tech. I think we underrate how demoralizing it is when it's just difficult to use and that it's it's like consistent torture because they're going into it all day, every day, and they know when they turn up tomorrow, they're going to have to do it again, you know, and so in, you know, really investing some energy into even how you choose and then roll out new technology is so important because it can, and we've experienced this in our practice, it can transform the morale and energy of the business. You know, mm. whereas I think historically, I think a lot of practices, unlike I'm sure with you and your business is much larger, where you really do consider these things as quite a project, right? That's natural in bigger businesses. In small businesses, I reckon there's the, gee, I saw this at a conference. That looks cool. Let's implement. And that's about as far as it gets. And change be, management, yeah. it's so important, right? <laughs> like, yeah, ch- change management's what it's all about. But you'd be surprised. So, uh, you know, the research at the moment would suggest that, um, you know, the best advice firms are using about 17 different bits of technology uh, yep. and the industry average is about 14. But uh, look, I love trying out new tech, uh, using new tech. But I've got to say, every time we need to introduce new technology, whether it's a new HR system, learning system, uh, workflow system, whatever it might be, uh, it can be really hard work. And um, it's the last thing that many people want to do is to come in and learn a new system as logging in. Where do I go to find what? What do I actually need to do? How do I prove something? Um, It can be a massive waste of time. And as you say, quite demoralizing. So that change management piece, getting people involved in the process early with the selection uh, and then having really um, solid training plans and more importantly, actually carving out time throughout the week yes. to have training sessions because we can't you know, magically create uh, more time than there really is and, and people are busy and don't necessarily want to be learning these things at six or seven o'clock at night or first thing in the morning. Absolutely. And look, we've found even, you know, repetition is is necessary. Six months later, let's revisit that early training we did on this piece of tech, like just constantly revisiting and and relooking at it. We've sort of taken an approach, and this isn't for the tiny little apps we might try out, for, but a big choice is we treat it like it's a recruitment. So we go through as much structure as you would to both select, you know, um, narrow down a list, uh, you know, recruit, and then even performance manage a new person. We do that with big pieces of tech just because it sort of makes it that real. Because a good piece of tech is like a person. You know, they become like a great resource in your business. Mm. So, you know, I love that you guys are drawing that out for staff because I think, if anything, um, there's a, a whole core of people in the industry, the you know, support staff that could be power planners or admin. And I think they're generally a little unloved. And if we can roll out great tech, it's going to make their lives so much easier. Absolutely. And, and I think there's also um, a risk that, you know, firms are introducing ne- new technology without going through that recruitment process, as, as you put it, um, to try and solve an individual problem without thinking about it more broadly and understanding how does it fit into the broader advice tech stack? How do we move data between the systems? Um, and, and that can obviously lead to huge inefficiencies, but also real risk. So if you've got different data sitting in different systems um, that's incorrect or, um, you know, not meant to be collected, such as TFNs, um, yeah. there is huge risk there. There really is. I mean, and one of the things, that's one of the things that came out of the report too, is this sort of rethinking the way we look at data as not an individual system-based thing, but across, you know, a practice or even an industry. So talk me through what came out about the way people are looking at that differently and what their plans are for the next sort of 12 months. Yeah, d- data is something that's um, you know, core to what we're doing at the moment. And, and I think every business needs to be thinking about data um, in a very different way. It's, it, it really is a firm's most valuable asset. Mm. Uh, so again, looking at the research, um, a, a number of firms across the industry for a number of years have been starting to think about data and, and how it might be used. Is it you know something that they can use internally for exception reporting or you know, trying to create efficiencies um, or deliver better client engagement and, and better client outcomes? Um, but the challenge is that you know with 17 different technologies typically operating in one of these, you know, great firms, yeah. um, you know, where do you start? How do you actually pull all that data out, make sure that it's consistent um, and the same so that you can then push it around around the ecosystem? Um, and, you know, our, our interest in this area has been now, um, you know, for many years. And that was a big part of the reason that we invested into Zeppo. Uh, and yep. as it turns out, that was a, a really good decision. Um, and certainly it's now looking like it's the most used uh, data integration tool in the industry. So excuse the plug. Uh, it's what the research <laughs> says. And it is it is uh, externally audited. Um, but, you know, the best best firms are the advice tech firms. So that is firms that we've identified within the market that have got high profitability, high client satisfaction, high cl- um, client uh, engagement as a result of their technology usage um, are already adopting this technology um, very deeply. Deeply and currently there's about 36 to I think 40% of advice tech stars using some sort of data integration solution. 
remarkably in the next 12 to 24 months, that's going to jump to 76%. Ooh. So what that really says is if you're not thinking about it, it's going to become very hard to compete uh, against these advice tech stars who are doing everything they can to use technology to their advantage. And I think uh, we often think, you know, the the data in this case might be either like product providers, so there might be some about the, the investments or things like that, or it might be something to do with our CRM, but there's so much more than that. To me, one of the key things that I really want to get a handle on is capacity. You know, so mm-hmm. what's the volume of activities that are going on? When are the peaks and troughs? Because we're all going to, like you said before, we're all going to struggle with hiring great people in the next little while, and you will be able to do that really well if you beautifully understand exactly what you need as opposed to just doing what we all do all the time and gee we'll just get a advisor or we'll just get a power planner you know so i think the data we can draw out there's about what gets completed what doesn't where the bottlenecks are you know all that sort of stuff is the sort of dials or dashboard that we you know would be fantastic for each business and really empower them to make the perfect next hire yeah, and, and to that point, and again, I'll, I'll talk to Zeppo just because it's a system I understand uh, pretty intimately. Um, that's one of the, the recent enhancements we've just rolled out. So Zeppo basically integrates with about 35 different enterprise solutions. So it goes in there, so X-Plan, Midwinter, Class BGL, uh, all the mortgage origination platforms, as well as workflow systems, uh, et cetera. So it's got a very, very broad set of data. Um, each night it goes in, reaches uh, into those various systems, pulls the data out, groups it, matches it, so that you can then create a single client file uh, across all of those different systems. Importantly, it'll raise exceptions. So if you've got date of birth different, um, you know, between class and x for example, it'll flag uh, that there's a discrepancy in the data and that goes, nice. you know, extremely deep. Yeah. Uh, but it also looks at, to your point, things like activity. Uh, it looks at revenue. So through a set of uh, very neat dashboards, um, advisors for the first time can really start to understand, okay, well, what is my revenue per uh, client group or, or family group? Um, how does that compare to prior corresponding periods? What are the services that they're buying? Um, have I provided them with FDSs and, and the, um, the, the ROAs, et cetera, that they might need? And then we now benchmark that. So you can start to see how does your individual metrics compare against the broader industry? So um, are you running more or less clients than the broader industry? How does your revenue per client group uh, for a particular size uh, right. So you start to get down and really understand um, you know, how your business is tracking against all of those key metrics using data from a very, very broad um, range of solutions. So th- things have really accelerated in the last couple of years and, and it's just great to see the direction it's all heading. Yeah, and the, and the connection of those data points can be so powerful because I think, you know, what might be the case is you've got a team of advisors and you might look at, say, revenue per advisor as a really simple metric, but, you know, one might have, say, a, a slower time to turn around or they might get through fewer, but their clients are actually stickier. You know, so it's being able to combine those data points and really see a sort of matrix for that advisor as opposed to some, you know, what seems like black and white data, but it's, it needs to be given context, you know, and so that's what I love about that sort of overarching data look is it's, it's context, it's depth to the data, yeah. it's meaning as opposed to just, is it more or less, you know, <laughs> which doesn't really add that much value. And, and that's the, the next uh, sort of, uh, I guess, horizon for us and, and the teams working on it. You know, we want to be able to prove that all the things that we're talking about actually add value. So, for example, uh, let's, let's look at profitability per, per advisor or per practice where they use a managed account for some clients or all of their clients or none of them. Um, let's look at uh, things like client engagement and all this, uh, the work that we're doing around client portals. Is it actually adding value or is it just something that we've cooked up in the background based on uh, you know the feedback that we're getting that may or may not be right? So actually statistically proving a lot of the things that we're talking about and then allowing you to, to slice and dice that data and, and benchmark it against uh, the cohorts that you want. Nice, nice. And so and you mentioned client portals. So client engagement was another sort of key theme that came out of the report. What I mean, to me, actually, the number of advisors even looking into getting client portal, I mean, that ratcheted up significantly. That was uh, interesting. It was probably a bit faster than I might have expected. Yeah, I think this is definitely a, um, a result of COVID. So as we know, um, particularly us Victorians, uh, <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time at home and all of our lives moved online uh, for everything, whether it was shopping, art classes, gym classes. Um, and within that, uh, most of the activities we were participating in were actually done via our mobile. So the, the actual tech adoption by all age groups, uh, even the older age groups, uh, was, was very significant. And you know, we often talk about this acceleration of adoption uh, and we're probably five to 10 years ahead of where we may have been had COVID not happened. Um, and I guess the outcome of that from a, from a client perspective is that, um, and interestingly, when we're talking to the advisable Australians, 
when they're looking for an advisor, their use of technology is actually part of their consideration set. So they want to know that their advisor actually has a digital way of interacting with them uh, because, as, as we've probably talked about before, believe it or not, no one enjoys signing paperwork. So little no. things like that, and, and I often joke the biggest innovation in fin services is the digital signature. Um, you know, Clients are actually looking for a lot more than that. Their, yeah. their last best experience was with a social media platform typically or Netflix or one of the other uh, streaming services. And they're highly personalized, um, really seamless, frictionless experiences. And that's what they expect from all of their providers, whether it's financial services um, or, or a social media company. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I mean, the interesting thing about client portals that um, we've been looking to this too is um, I think all of us are also sick of having so many channels that we need to be aware of to try and interact, you know, even me as an individual, let alone as an advisor. And I think the beauty of a portal is you can start to have that window that the client knows that's the way to get a hold of you. you know, that, that's the ideal channel. And it can be used in lots of different ways. Um, they don't just have to be into chat. It can be all sorts of things, but it, it's just that consistent channel and it can cut through the noise of all the others. I mean, we're now at the point where both email and SMS are so spammed, it's becoming impossible to get through to people. So we need a direct channel. I, I don't think we've got a choice really. There is nothing worse than getting spammed by SMS. It's my, my right. biggest uh, bugbear. Uh, and, and I agree with that. Everyone's getting smashed by information across every channel. Um, and, you know, a key uh, point of difference or really a, a benefit for an advisor in the future is uh, being that curator of information and um, driving them to a portal where they know and they can trust that the information that they're getting uh, has actually had oversight, if you like, because, uh, again, you pick up the fin today and, um, you know, clearly markets overnight have been disastrous, uh, but the headlines amplify that uh, and it's yeah. not productive for an advice relationship and, and it creates anxiety and uncertainty and, and all the emotions that, that everyone listening would be aware of. So, yeah, using a client portal, uh, there is so much utility and really as a business and as advisors, it's about thinking about what are the multiple touch points that we can deliver on a digital basis, not to replace advice or, or face-to-face, but to augment it and yes. create a self-service environment um, that is effectively 24-7 where it could be delivering daily news, broadcast emails, market updates. It could be document signing. It could be that they just want to check on their mortgage repayments, uh, their portfolio, uh, or just chat to you to see how things yeah. are going. So there's, there's so many things that can be done and, um, and effect- effectively centralised through a branded environment um, yep. that strengthens that um, relationship. It's a bit of a no-brainer moving forward. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, for all of us, uh, what we've noticed is uh, we've been watching the cost of, of advice in the practice from day dot, but particularly in the last few years. And while the pr- production of advice has always been a focus, what I'm now seeing is that um, admin or follow-ups is costing us more than the advice is right now. So, mm. so to me, anything that helps cut through for the client to just get them to act quickly because it's right in their hand, um, and like, yep, nope, or sign, like anything like that, because it's not, it's not that they're avoiding doing it; it's just that they're busy. We all are, you know. So, anything that cuts through that, I think, can massively reduce the extent of that sort of mindless follow-up activity that can go on in a practice, um, which I think we've probably all experienced um, over the last little while. One of the other client engagement things that was interesting to me in the report was the presentation tools. That took a bit of a hype mm. too, didn't it? You know, and I mean, I love the idea that maybe more advisors are using things like Canva, um, which a whole lot of them wouldn't have even known what it was, you know, a few years ago. So that's a bit exciting. Yeah, it's certainly changed. And again, I think a lot of this comes back to uh, that sort of need to deliver more interactive, personalised reviews online. So uh, clearly during COVID again, uh, it wasn't possible to sit down with a client and do a page turn. So things went online. And I think when you put a PDF online, you realise just potentially how dull it can be. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> so, you know, what, what, what are the things that can be done, you know, whether it's videos, GIFs, Uh, audio files uh, or just even the ability to drill down and and do reviews online that are more interactive Uh, and you know clearly that's now being picked up across the industry and and I agree Uh, you know Canva is a very easy tool to be uh, to to use Um, clearly it's you know been very successful uh, and there's just it just adds that element of um, you know customization and and in many cases fun to a uh, to a review. And any um, any listeners that haven't checked out Canva, I mean, they have marketing professionals that design templated presentation tools that people use to get VC funding. Like these things mm. are designed to have impact, um, to engage. And so, you know, why would we try and do that ourselves? That's nuts. You know, use mm. the tools that we have sort of available just, to us. 
And just on that one, the other, the other um, you know, key point, and this, this is not necessarily related to the advice tech report, it's just how humans absorb information. Uh, that's the other key part that came out of the, the presentation area, which was that we need to recognise people absorb information differently. Um, mm-hmm. Some people are, uh, are oral or they prefer to, to receive uh, information through an audible uh, means, uh, but also most people are, are visual. So that ability to... Think about information, whether it's through uh, infographics uh, or you know just better charting and more visual graphs, and then supporting it with uh, with the detail for those that want to delve into it. Really important, um, and trying to understand your clients and have that conversation with them, so that in future again you can personalise reviews to to their needs and outcomes. Um, I was chatting to an advisor the other day. This particular one operates in the uh, the family office, uh, high net worth space. Mm-hmm. And they spend most of their time actually on their review packs. To the point where some of the uh, the older clients or the matriarchs, patriarchs, um, they have specific requirements around the fonts that are used, the font size, the colours. Um, <laughs> wow. And it sounds ridiculous. And it's not just that they've got nothing else to complain about. It's that to them, it's really important. Um, but very few of us actually ask our clients, how do you want to receive this information? Do you want war and peace or do you just want a quick summary? Um, do you understand the information I'm giving you? All those sort of things. Absolutely. And I think um, the more, I mean, I'd love every listener to really, you know, do some digging and understand what an infographic truly is, because we have been producing graphs in our industry for years, decades even, that take five minutes to describe. And if you need to describe and run the client through the graph, it is failing. It's not doing its job. So whereas an infographic is designed for a snapshot immediate message, you know, that you can just look at it immediately, understand what it means and what it's trying to tell you. So I think if more of us could try and understand that and deliver things that way, we'd find the cut through would be massive. So your so the client portal thing came up in engagement. Clearly at NetWell specifically, you've been investing in that as a tool that, you know, advisors can take advantage of for their clients. I mean, you know, there's apps for platforms and, you know, clients can see their balances and all that sort of stuff. How does the net wealth portal go beyond that? What did you guys and what's on the radar that you want to put in the portal to sort of really take advantage of the insights you've got from the report? Yes, this is a, a trend we identified a few years ago mm. um, and it was, you know, pretty clear what was happening in the, in the mobile space. So we started to work through what, what our strategy was and, and potentially slightly altruistic in its approach. But uh, we wanted to create a bit of technology that was independent of the NetWealth platform. And we felt that was really important if we were going to be successful and have the adoption um, that we're, we're starting to see. So what we've built out is um, a bit of technology that can be white labeled. So it's fully native for Android and iOS. Um, it, we delivered it initially with the typical sort of platform information. So you can log in using your face and all those sort of, uh, you know, important security features um, to get your portfolio. Uh, but we set out to design it so that it was a bit more engaging than just, um, you know, I guess your, your, your portfolio and, and basic information. So we had to design something that we felt was going to appeal to um, the millennials or the, the millennials with uh, money, the emerging yep. affluent. Uh, as well as the established affluent, so those older clients that um, also you know, had significant uh, portfolio value. So trying to straddle both of those markets and get something appealing to both was was quite a design challenge, but we, we feel we got there. Uh, and then it was important that we started to, referring back to our discussion earlier, um, think about and and, um, and build out the other things that people might want to do within that financial app outside of just looking at their portfolio because we recognise that that's not something people should necessarily be doing every day or every week. Yeah. Uh, and many people might actually, in fact, only do it each year when they get their annual statement. So what, what else can we do to, to bring people back into the app to create that, that engagement model? Um, so we introduced um, bank feeds. So you can link through about 170 um, different institutional feeds, including frequent flyer points and, and afterpay balances, uh, all of the, the banking and debt, which you'll be able to link through to your property. Uh, we've just gone live with property feeds in the uh, in the desktop, and that'll be going to the mobile in the next couple of weeks, where you can link through to domain, uh, and it'll Perfect. pull through uh, all of the information, so pictures, valuations, which you can override if you if you don't agree. Um, and at the end of October, we'll be introducing the ability to uh, link all of the data collected from within Zeppo uh, into the mobile app. So what that means for a firm that uses um, NetWealth uh, yep. and one of the other platforms they can use a consistent digital experience uh, and interface for all of their clients, regardless of the platform that they use. And, and that was really important to us because we understand and recognize that whilst it be fantastic, um, you know, a, a practice <laughs> isn't going to use entirely net wealth. Uh, there's always reasons, whether it's through a transition or tax uh, or just different feature set that a practice will use two or three platforms. So being able to support all of the platforms, bringing your banking um, 
and also your property and um, and also things like uh, over time zero and my ob data so you can look at your financial data um, and uh, firm wide documents so that's uh, that's all in place or, or getting very close uh, beyond that all the things that we talked about so chat document vaults document signing uh, they're all very much uh, on the roadmap as well as the ability to set tasks and workflow uh, and have uh, real time consent and uh, digital uh, consent yeah and I think um, you know clients need us to nag. You know, a lot of clients just need us to nudge and nag. But if that can be an alert on their phone, that is a cut through that you just can't achieve any other way. You know, it's just, Mm. it's so powerful. So I think for all, it seems like a small thing. Um, Being able to set the client a to-do as opposed to us is so, it's it's magic. I think that will make a world of difference for people, particularly if they can then immediately act. You know, if they can do Absolutely. that within the app, that's powerful. And I think um, the other thing I'd say, you know, with the you know, the combination of, say, the net wealth feed, but then bank feeds is these sort of things are really exciting to us because, like, that's fantastic. The thing is the public think that's what pos- is possible already. Like, it's, that's the problem with some of these innovations is they're like, well, duh, do you mean you couldn't do that before? You know, so, you know, it's great that they're coming, but it's it's just something they're like, oh, well, of course. I mean, I yes you know and they don't understand a lot of their bank you know even their bank apps won't do that sort of thing you know so they can't see everything in one place so i love that if they can't do it with a bank app at least they can with their investment or super that it'll be able to capture everything else so i think that's a real win for the client i, I still love that moment though when we when we show it to some of our clients and it's almost it's almost like magic <laughs> when, when, when all this information suddenly appears within the one portal uh, but you're right it's become a bit of an expectation and, and and we're certainly not trailblazing in that regard but we felt that it was an important foundational feature that it was almost a must-have before we could really uh, sort of take on and tackle the, the client portal market yeah definitely i completely agree so in terms then of was there any other standouts in terms of the report that you wanted to cover things that were like those big themes that that stood out for this year uh, so yeah, data integration and data integration technology, huge. We've talked about uh, mobile um, and client engagement, uh, very significant. Um, the other one, and, and I don't want this to sound like a, an ongoing adver- uh, advertisement for, for NetWealth, but um, you know, managed, managed accounts are having uh, just a incredible growth uh, and have become um, increasingly mainstream. And what, what we see is every time there's volatility or market corrections, uh, the, the level of inquiries for managed accounts tends to spike uh, right. when people look back and say, oh, that is the last time I ever want to have to generate you know, hundreds of ROAs or whatever it might be to change client portfolios, which then take me three weeks to implement when it could have been done you know, effectively overnight. Yeah. Um, so we saw some incredible outcomes off the back of uh, the COVID volatility and, and the more recent volatility where uh, portfolio managers were meeting effectively daily, uh, looking at overnight data, making rapid changes, de-risking portfolios uh, across all clients. So it's very equitable. Um, equitable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also taking advantage of opportunities on the way up. So uh, managed accounts, I think, are expected to rise to about 60% adoption across the market in the next 12 to 24 months and currently sitting at 45 uh, but with uh, the advice tech stars and more professional firms and integrated firms having already adopted and, and very much on their managed account journey. Yeah, exciting. And that's sort of, I mean, you've got multiple layers then. It's the client focus, it's the staff, it's the internal efficiencies. Like there's multiple layers there, which is fabulous. And that's how we'll get a real sort of evolution of how we do things is when it covers, you know, all of them. Well, I'm sort of curious then as we sort of lead into wrapping up then, you know, you've been, you know, like me, a bit of a tech geek for a long time and you've been looking forward or trying to look forward for advice um, for some time. What do you see as the thing you're really curious about that bit further out? Like what's the thing that seems like that's the next exciting thing that we can all sort of look forward to or, or implement? So there's a lot of things happening in the industry. Um, personally, I'm really excited to see a lot of the initiatives that we've been working on over the last four or five years coming together uh, yep. into a really co- cohesive uh, environment. So for me, that's you know really exciting. And, and, and I think in the next um, six to 12 months, we'll be in an incredible position to really help advisors drive efficiency stuff, um, engagement, but also the, the client engagement. Um, the bit that I'm intrigued and, and very curious about at the moment, um, and I've just finished a very long-winded uh, article uh, in the FIN about the, uh, the advice review at the moment, it's just where that's going to end up. I mean, there is talk <laughs> at the moment um, about scrapping a best interest duty, scrapping SOAs, scrapping ROAs, and effectively providing a, uh, an environment whereby uh, anyone working within a financial institute can give advice. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is serious uh, and the implications are, are very wide ranging. And a, a big part of that is just digital advice. What does that actually yeah. mean? Do clients want to do it themselves? Are they still looking for a coaching relationship? Is it about, again, augmenting the advice relationship? 
where does that actually go? And uh, I think, you know, clearly there's a lot of work to be done. Um, in many ways, um, whilst a lot of this is, is great news for the industry, there's going to be a huge amount of work to implement any of these changes. So sometimes uh, the removal of legislation is as disruptive as the introduction of legislation, uh, but it appears to be heading in the right direction. And, and ultimately, if we can lower the cost to serve, lower the cost to advice um, and provide advice to more Australians, that's a, an awesome outcome. Yeah, and I think, you know, losing some of those handcuffs that I feel maybe the industry has been restrained by, I think is exciting. You know, I'm with you on that. But, you know, this is the I've built a house and it's so ugly, I've decided I'm going to knock knock it down and build it again. That's still a horrible process. Like you can't underrate that it's hard enough doing it once, you know, let alone deciding to wipe the thing out and start again. So I, you know, as a practice owner, I'm I'm wary of how difficult that'll be and that it'll be a bit retread. That's the, the other frustration, isn't it? Is it like, we've done all this effort. We're going to be doing it again, clearly. So that, I mean, that, that's hard not to get a little frustrated. About. Totally. And having spent way too much time and way too much resources, even on things like fee consent and fee renewal last year, to read that that might be on the chopping block is in many ways fantastic news, but my God. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, Where do I send that t- bill? Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. And I mean, it's interesting for us and no doubt everyone listening, uh, you know, there's a whole heap of stuff that we're working on around, you know, digitising ROAs and all the rest of it. Do we stop that work or do we push ahead with it yeah. on the basis this could take a long time and there's a lot of water to go under the bridge? And I, and I think, unfortunately, it's probably the latter uh, because yeah. this could go in any direction. I think it has the potential to become very politicised as well. Yeah, and I think the unfortunate part of all of us it is is it's just more uncertainty. And I think that's pro- probably what we're all a bit done with. You know, I think change is great. I mean, you and I probably are at the top end of really enjoying that process, but I think uncertainty is difficult, you know, and it's difficult mm. to sustain um, managing that. So I'm with you. Let's. I'm sort of powering along um, with the view that there may be some new news down the track, but, hey, we've just got to continue as is because who knows how long it'll take, you know. Um, so, but I, I mean, I have to admit one of the things that, and I don't know whether you've played with much at all, you know, VR was touted for some years it's been touted as sort of the next best thing. And I've always struggled a bit, you know, I mean, nobody really wants to look at a graph in 3D, right? I mean, <laughs> that's just not going to engage a consumer. But I'm excited to see whether anybody sort of takes it down the goals path where somebody could be looking at their future and then based on scenarios, it grays out, you know, almost like, you know, that thing you wanted to do, no, that's not possible. So it sort of grays, you know, that sort of thing where you make what the choices they're making really tangible. So I don't know whether you've seen anything like that out there or on your, you know, South by Southwest joints and all the sort of things you're doing. Is anybody getting really clever with VR or is it still a bit of a game as paradise and that's the only way it's being used? I actually went and bought myself an Oculus uh, at the start of the year for this exact reason. I had to understand where it was going, what it all meant. Uh, yeah. Also, I was, I was really interested in what it means for the future of work uh, because and in the same way that we're now on a, on a Zoom call or a Riverside call, yeah. um, if people um, do continue to work remotely, which they, they will, um, is there a better way to actually engage in a 3D world? Um, I think having a meeting or an executive or a board meeting with avatars is probably still uh, a little way off. Um, yeah. I think it's, it provides some interesting opportunities for advisors when delivering reviews to their clients remotely because it could be a far more interactive experience where you sit around a virtual table in your choice of location. So it might be that you, you do want to have a meeting in Hawaii uh, and uh, and then you've got these incredible resources at your fingertips almost where you can you know, point to the wall and pull up um, different scenarios and graphs that are, are far more interactive. Um, your, your example, though, actually one that I presented on probably five, six years ago now, uh, which was exactly that. So you work through a risk profile and you show the scenario outcomes of taking on different types of risks. So um, your risk profile says you need to be a high risk to get to the objective that you want, which is drinking champagne on a ship. Uh, Unfortunately, you've also suggested you're very conservative and the thought of investing into anything other than a term deposit uh, makes you anxious. uh, And therefore, that large P&O ship that you're wanting to go on might be more like a tugboat going down the canals of somewhere less exotic. Uh, and but, but actually being able to visualise that, and there was, there was some great uh, research done, uh, and I think they've actually implemented it to try and help people quit smoking and drinking. Uh, and they basically 
simulated what their their faces and, and their bodies uh, would look like if they continued at the rate that they were. And I think when you end up staring back at yourself um, yes. and it had the, the, the with smoking, without smoking uh, visual, it was pretty confronting and it actually changed people's behaviours very significantly. So I don't, there's no reason that that can't be done. Um, the Oculus is pretty pretty uncomfortable. Uh, so yeah. I, I think the hardware needs to get better. But look, I think it's not here tomorrow. It's probably not next year, but at some point in the future, we'll see some really interesting use cases. Yeah, and I think particularly if you can, like you're saying, not replicate reality in virtual reality. It's like, no, it needs to be better. You know, like it needs mm. to be, even to attend conferences, like why wouldn't I fly in on the Millennium Falcon as part of Correct. the VR experience? Don't make me walk through a conference center, you know? So I think that's the, where we've sort of got to let our imagination go. And I think that's how we can really sort of, you know, lift the energy about it. Was it we've covered a lot. So is there anything we else have. we've missed? Anything else you wanted to highlight? Um, I'm sure there is, but I'm also conscious that uh, all of this stuff's like drinking from a fire hydrant. So uh, having complained about the amount of information everyone's receiving earlier, why why don't we leave it at that? Perfect. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about the Advice Tech Report and NetWealth's client portal, then the website links are going to be in the episode show notes, um, along with Matt's LinkedIn details. If you want to, you know, stalk him and nudge him about some things you might want out of of NetWealth, (laughs) then please reach out. Um, Look, I hope you, the listener, got some value out of sort of hearing us geek out over the future of technology, you know, and this is what happens when you get two tech geeks, you know, with mics. Um, We're always going to go a bit longer and get excited about the, the nerdiness, but Look, thank you so much for joining us, Matt, and for NetWell supporting the first season of the XY Advice Tech Podcast. Pleasure. Good to be involved. So, have you already checked out the 2022 NetWealth Advice Tech Report, you know, or perhaps you even utilize a client portal like uh, NetWealth or the others out there? You know, maybe do you agree or disagree with our discussion? So, Either way, please share your insights on the XY platform as I'd love to hear your take um, along with, you know, what tech really caught your eye in the report. There's a lot of detail there and there's even sort of three sections of the report you can download separately. So there's a lot to digest, but I'd really encourage you to take that time. Now, in terms of sort of my thoughts on it, then, you know, this report is a really great example of where your curiosity muscle that we've sort of been developing over these episodes will come into play. So perhaps before you even take a look at the report, give yourself just like five minutes to brainstorm what areas you feel need an upgrade in your business. Maybe areas you feel would lift operations or the client experience or your effectiveness. You know, just some bullet points, really just get you thinking down on paper. Think about maybe the short or, or medium term and then even in the longer term. Then read through the advice tech report and take a look at the trends but also sort of just trust your gut on and see what really catches your eye in the report. What are the things that stand out? What are the things that seem like, a oh, hold on, I think that could be something that could really resolve that challenge we're facing or that opportunity we want to take. So then take a look back at the list you made at those immediate needs and see if some of the tech you're both curious about might also meet the need, right? So we're starting to sort of align both the things that – we're interested in and that catch our eye and the things we know should be a focus in the business. And to Matt's point, give some real thought as to how they might roll out and add further value down the track. You know, think about the bigger picture, think about where this is taking you. You know, and feel free to also just make a wish list or a, you know, curious app list as well. You know, something you can go back to later of the apps or even the tech categories that you might want to check out when you sort of got a moment and it's a bit quieter. It might be later in the year or the beginning of a new year and you want to check a few more things out and get your, your energy, your energy up. So make one of those lists uh, so that you can just add things to it and you know you won't miss them. Now, As we've been talking about successfully implementing technology, you know, how do you roll it out with your staff? What are the change management techniques you need? Then for today's Curiosity Corner, I'm going to bring to your attention a little app I've come across that does one specific thing really well. For this week's Curiosity Corner, I'd love you to check out Tango. Now, you'll find it at tango.us.us. And basically, their tagline is document what you're doing instantly. This is basically a free browser extension that actually generates these gorgeous step-by-step guides while you're doing something you want to explain to somebody else. 
Yeah. So basically you turn Tango on and you just complete the process that you're trying to capture. And Tango documents your step-by-step actions with automatic screenshots and written instructions. <laughs> it does all of that for you. Then once you've completed this, the task, then you can trim, you can revise it a bit. You can even finalize you know, your new step-by-step workflow description. You can add text descriptions, you can blur some stuff out, um, and you can annotate it at, to your heart's content. And then you're able to either link it, links, you know, create a link so somebody can look at it directly. You can download it as a PDF, you can copy and paste it, or you can even embed it uh, in existing documents, maybe a learning management system, a wiki, um, or even a team chat, you know. So this is fantastic for getting new hires up to speed really fast, right? Because it's every step you take to do something. It can massively improve productivity for you and your team um, because you the ninja tips, the team can just quickly do the ninja tip and then share it with the team. And you can even empower customers with some self-serve sort of resources. So showing them how to click on things, showing them how to click, you know, through a portal, showing them how to, you know, all that sort of thing can be captured for those that like to see or maybe even print out and have something next to them as they're trying it for the first time. So look, Tango is well worth a look uh, and I'd love to hear what you think of it. Well, whew, that's all we've got for this week. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each week. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event to brief your audience on how they too can become bionic advisors, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P E I T A M D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.